EVs are all the rage. They're catching on. They're coming on quick. And so is wind and solar and battery storage. Uh, but how good of the news is this uh, for the people who sell all of that uh, dirty, dirty fossil fuel? I've got Paul Foss, a contributor for Clean Technica, joining us and a uh, guaranteed reservation holder prepaid for the Roadster. Very exciting times. I'm Brian. Welcome to Futuraza. Paul, great news you got this morning or yesterday morning, uh, some days ago now, probably when this airs. Uh, let's start with that real quick. Got some good news for us, I trust, right? Yeah, I'm I'm excited about, uh, I, I've been lucky enough to get a, a prepaid Roadster uh, as a result of all my referrals uh, from writing at uh, Clean Technica. And uh, I think I got that back in uh, 2018, 2019. So it's, it's been a little wait. Some people are impatient. I guess I'll consider myself, you know, pretty patient on that. It, whatever it takes, uh, you know, I, I'm grateful for uh, uh, for what I get. And then this latest news is, of course, uh, Elon uh, mentioning that it'll be kind of their best uh, product ever. I, I think he said the, the best demo ever. Uh, yes. Product demo. Uh, I think there's been rumors that the acceleration zero to 60 would be less than one second, which uh, has got to be incredibly painful. Uh, <laughs> anything that the fastest I've done is uh, 2.8 and that was borderline painful. So it, it will be interesting to me. Anything under four takes my breath a little bit. It's, it's alarming to me at that point, but what we're talking about today is uh, something a little less exciting. It is the doom of fossil fuel investments. Now this is an older story, but this is as timeless and relevant as ever. Uh, why don't you start us off here? Sure. Now, I um, am not the author of this, but this is uh, when I when I read this, uh, I thought, wow, this is an incredibly good article. Uh, I assume maybe you'll link it uh, to this video. It's about a 35 minute read. I'm just going to cover uh, a small part of it. It's, it's basically a small book, but um, the recent news is the Biden administration has paused the authorization to build new liquid natural gas terminals. In other words, the terminals that are already built can continue to export gas and new ones can be built as long as they were previously approved, but they're not approving any new ones for well, they said it's being paused. I don't know how long that pause is. So the part I'm going to uh, talk about today is how EV sales, which uh, I talk about a lot and Brian talks about a lot, uh, basically a nine step way of how those things affect uh, the prices of LNG and electricity because right. uh, all these things are interconnected. Uh, EVs, oil, electricity, LNG. I don't want this to be all me, Brian. But... Sure. Well, so the thing is, a lot of energy is, it is fungible. If you need more electricity on the grid, you can always get more, even if it requires fossil fuel. Today, a lot of it worldwide still is, but that is transitioning now. Uh, utility companies, which have a heavy reliance on fossil fuels, are also in trouble. Because there is a bit of a death spiral. Oil demand is mostly for cars and trucks, and it will be destroyed. And then elect so coal demand is going down. So the residual demand for airplane steel making and plastic feedstocks will not be enough to prevent the extraction refining companies from losing enormous amounts of money. So, so the particular thing I was going to go down and. Uh... You know, I, I said I was going to make nine points and we're not going to go deep into each of them because they're each, you know, a whole video. The first is that EVs over the next five or 10 years are going to kind of replace traditional cars for, and and trucks and, and things like that. And I don't think we need to debate that. We're, we're in agreement. And, and that's another debate if you don't think uh, transportation is being electrified. But that's step one. Point number two is that transportation is 
a major part of oil demand. Their oil is used for many other things, paints and plastics and home heating oil, but certainly transportation is, uh, I, I don't have the figures, but I think it's something like 30 to 50% of oil, oil demand. Uh, mm -hmm. Certainly very, uh, a very major part. Point three, and this will sound a little bit like an economics professor, which I, I did spend a year uh, teaching macro and micro 30 years ago. And that is talking about the elasticity of supply, meaning a small change in supply or demand has a big effect on the oil prices. And economists call that an inelastic uh, market. And we can certainly see that over the last 50 years when there's just some minor uh, disruption in supply and 3% of supply is held up because of some war, you know, prices skyrocket. The same happens like when, when COVID uh, reduced demand a small amount, yeah. prices dropped uh, even to uh, a negative future. And what we see with that is, uh, a good way to think about it is it, the the real version is one refinery in one place has to go offline for maintenance or repairs. And all of a sudden you see half the country is now paying an extra 10, 20, 30 cents because the supply is that inelastic. Uh, a, another example, a good analogy you could think of is on during the week of spring break, you may notice traffic is wide open. How many fewer cars are on the road? It feels like half, but in fact, it's only 10% less, maybe 5% less, depending where you live. And a small amount can make a big, big, big impact, really. So the next point is when oil prices drop, if, if you've studied rig counts, that's what the oil industry does, is um, all of a sudden, these marginal oil drillers will say, well, I was going to drill in, in whatever place, whether it's North Dakota or Texas or whatever. They're like, oh, oil prices are only $30 a barrel or $40 a barrel. Uh, I can only make it work if prices are 50 or, or higher. So the drilling counts just drop, maybe not to zero, but, you know, uh, dramatically. So that's that's the next uh, domino that you know reliably happens I, I i don't think that's uh controversial uh and, and on that point i would say that there were people who when gas prices went to a dollar during lockdown said i want that back i want a dollar a gallon back and i tried to tell them you can't have a dollar at a dollar they will stop producing oil they would have to pay you to take it at that point basically because it costs more than a dollar to get it to your tank you can have it for a dollar for a short period of time but it's not long-term sustainable right. is what you mean exactly well yeah. they want it i want it forever if they can sell it for a dollar then i said they couldn't they couldn't sell it for a dollar they were just getting rid of it and yeah if you look at what percentage of that last dollar was actually going to the oil company not the gas station not the taxes they were probably only getting after transportation half of it maybe less so it is not sustainable. So uh, now this is a part that he explains in the article and people that have invested in oil companies, I have invested in oil companies in the past, know, but I don't think the general public knows that natural gas is mainly a byproduct. Uh, there are natural gas wells, but a lot of the natural gas production is just as a byproduct of oil production. So one of the things that will happen is as oil production goes down, and, and that's really the dog, uh, the tail of the dog, gas, will, will go down. So even if natural gas prices don't go down because of EVs, and, and I don't really see why they would, they're, uh, you know, it's a separate market, that will cause gas to go, uh, gas, natural gas production to go down, that portion of which that is a byproduct of oil drilling. And especially fracking, fracked wells, although that's been a tremendously positive um, 
innovation for the U.S. Uh, oil and gas production, those wells don't last as long. Uh, where a traditional well might last 30 or 40 years, a fracked well uh, will, ma will last a lot shorter period of time. And uh, it's allowed us to get a lot more energy from our existing known fields, as it were. Uh, and it is not without its problems. It is very controversial for a number mm -hmm. of reasons that are completely legitimate. Uh, getting rid of this industry is not necessarily a bad thing, but it is, like you were saying, uh, the other thing with the, with the byproduct thing is the reason ships use bunker oil is because it is mm. also a byproduct of refining. And, uh, you know, jet fuel, these are all separate products made from the same thing. And if you have, if you take out just the gasoline part of the equation, you might have an imbalance in terms of what they're actually making. I'm not sure how that works. Yeah, the whole cracking of the of the oil. I, I've also heard, and I believe this article has something about that asphalt versus concrete. A lot of people use asphalt just because it's a little bit cheaper than concrete. But if uh, something would make oil prices uh, go up, uh, or if just because of this we have less, you know, that's a market you know, that may kind of die, die out. And not that that would be a bad thing. Concrete is generally a better uh, surface, although I know both asphalt and concrete have carbon issues. But concrete, I think, is a better surface to... Uh... So the last point, uh, or the point I was, I was making was that gas production will go down. And then before I was talking about the elasticity of the oil market, the elasticity of the natural gas market is also low, meaning uh, the wells, once you have a well, you don't want to stop uh, pumping of that. And the people and the plants that use natural gas, those are uh, inflexible long-term assets. So their elasticity is also very low. So what does that mean? A small reduction in natural gas production will cause prices to spike. And if you look at natural gas prices over the last, once again, 50 years, 30 years, any any period, you can see they are volatile. Uh, wow. We got scared during the Ukraine, Russia's invasion of Ukraine that, uh, uh, and when Germany quit buying uh, gas from Russia. I don't know if they completely stopped, but they definitely slowed their purchase. Prices spiked there. Even in the U.S., I believe the natural gas price uh, kind of spiked from three dollars to nine dollars. So you know, those are are very big swings. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty crazy to think that those markets aren't even connected. But again, energy is a commodity and when you're talking about something that you can put on a ship and move like natural gas, it can have a pretty big global ripple. Uh, very crazy to think that it would be a 300% swing, but I guess that's what happens. So you may say, what's the point? I, I listed a lot of steps, but the point is actually when I'm talking to people about solar and whether solar is competitive with natural gas and and solar is a little bit cheaper than natural gas, but natural gas does have advantages such as it's dispatchable and you can use it even when renewables, you know, when it's dark outside and it's not windy and your battery is run down. So it is kind of a good last resort. But the point of all that is don't assume just because the prices now are relatively low, I believe they're below $3 uh, a unit for natural gas. These factors and, and many other wars and things uh, make natural gas uh, economically a, a very volatile um, source of energy. Okay. The price is very volatile. Now we're seeing a lot of, what I would consider good news. 
uh, the price of wind and solar is continuing to fall. This article, while not the most current, uh, recognized the trend already. And it was saying, look, this is happening. Uh, and then you get a lot of people who really want to delay, delay, delay. And I can't imagine who would fund such a campaign. Uh, I can't imagine who's making, you know, $100 billion a day from, the, from delaying these kinds of tactics. It could be anybody. It's probably me. I've got that kind of money. But the big thing is now with when you include batteries as well, the cost is still uh, competitive. Wind and solar plus stationary storage in many places is already beating out the competition. And the beauty of having a grid is that, yes, it's not always daytime, but the wind does blow at night. And if you look at, I've pulled up charts in the past to see solar production by season and wind production by season. And would you believe the wind blows a little stronger in the winter months, which makes up for the summer shortfall. And even in mm -hmm. very North countries, countries at high la out, uh, latitudes, their solar can still work effectively as a, as a year round source. Any amount of daylight is going to produce a little bit of juice. And weather is one of those things that, I don't know if you know this, you can kind of predict. Not with pinpoint accuracy for your house, but you're not looking at something as small as a house. You're looking at something as small as a region, a county maybe. If you want to know what the average cloud coverage is going to be in a county three days out, you have a pretty good odds of getting it close enough to tell the grid what to expect. So there's some big benefits there. And if uh, in the short term, if uh, there's a time when it's going to be both cloudy uh, and fairly calm, so you're not going to get much wind nor solar, although solar will produce, uh, you know, some when it's cloudy, just less. Uh, in the short term, you can fire up uh, a fossil fuel peaker plant. You can use nuclear if there's a nuclear plant uh, available. Uh, and and have, hydro is relatively uh, dispatched. Hydro available. Hydro yeah. can crank up. Those are dispatchable. And then if you don't have any of those available, as long as you're grid connected and you have some transmission lines to other regions, you can get uh, that other region doesn't have to meet your peak demand. As long as you have some batteries, what you can do, especially as you said, if you can predict the weather, you can say to these other regions, hey, I'm going to need power in three days. Can you ship me over? Um, I'll, I'll get my batteries all fully charged up, um, you know, to go into that three days where it is going to be cloudy. And that that can make up for it. Yeah. Um, as long as we have transmission from somewhere else um, that has one of the many power sources right. available to make electricity. And... Some people say, well, yeah, but the wind isn't always blowing. And I say the wind is always blowing somewhere. And if you look at, for example, I think it's called the Pacific Interconnect. It is a thousand miles long. It runs from Washington all the way to almost the Mexico border in L.A. It's a long and it's been running for like 40 years. It's a very effective system. And transmission losses are something like 2%. So it's not like you're losing a lot of the power. And because we have so much hydro in Washington, we sell that power. And I literally have a line item on my bill at the end of the month that says negative $7. We sold it to California. Uh -huh. It doesn't say it in those terms. It doesn't say it quite like that, but it's what it is. So it's a very interesting and effective uh, system and it can work. It is hopeful. I am hopeful, Paul. You've made me more hopeful. Uh, not so much for the fossil fuel guys, but that's not my problem. So, guys, what did we miss? What did we misunderstand? Leave it in the comments below and stay tuned, stay juicy, and I cannot wait to hear from you clever robots on the next one.